In this video, we will be constructing hypothesis tests and confidence intervals for two population means, and we will focus on independent samples. To start with, we are going to now need two different populations. This might be males and females, for example. For each population, there exists a population mean, a population standard deviation, a sample mean, a sample standard deviation, and a sample size. And that's why we have denoted these with subscripts 1 and 2 to indicate the population that we're referring to. For our purposes, we will always be using a null hypothesis in which mu sub 1 is equal to mu sub 2. That is, we will be assuming that the two population means are exactly equal to each other. Another way to say this is mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2 is equal to 0, so the difference between the two population means is 0. For the alternative hypothesis, we can say mu sub 1 is greater than mu sub 2, mu sub 1 is less than mu sub 2, or mu sub 1 is not equal to mu sub 2. And these would be equivalent ways of writing those inequalities. For example, mu sub 1 being greater than mu sub 2 would be the same as mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2 is greater than 0. Here's the formula for constructing the confidence interval for two means. And we need to start with our point estimate at x bar 1 minus x bar 2. And then from that, we add and subtract the margin of error, which is our critical t-score times the square root of the first sample standard deviation squared over the first sample size, plus the second sample standard deviation squared over the second sample size. For the test statistic for a hypothesis test, we calculate the t-score using the formula x sub 1 bar minus x sub 2 bar, so the two sample means subtracted, minus mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2, we remember from our null hypothesis that we assume mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2 to be equal to 0. Since that is our assumption, this value is going to be equal to 0 and therefore can be crossed out of our test statistic formula. So the test statistic formula can be reduced down to x sub 1 bar minus x sub 2 bar in the numerator. And then we'll divide that by the square root of the first standard deviation, sample standard deviation squared, divided by n sub 1, plus s sub 2 squared, divided by n sub 2. In both cases, in order to determine a t-score or a p-value, we will need degrees of freedom, and we will be using the smaller of the two sample sizes, minus 1. So if you had a sample size of 30 and another sample size of 29, then you would have 28 degrees of freedom because that would be the smaller sample size minus 1. Let's look at an example. A store would like to determine if a different layout will increase customer impulse spending. They collect data for two different layouts, A and B, and find the following sample statistics. We can label each of these sample statistics with subscripts A or B depending on the layout that they represent. Use a 0.05 significance level to test the claim that layout B increases customer impulse spending. Our null hypothesis will be that mu sub A equals mu sub B, or in other words, the two layouts have no difference in their mean. And the alternative hypothesis will be that mu sub A is less than mu sub B. Or in other words, layout B has a higher mean spending amount. Now we need to calculate our test statistic. After plugging in all of the given values and then typing into the calculator, we come up with a t-score of about negative 1.742. On the t-distribution above, if I input my value of negative 1.742, and I shade the area to the left, that area is the p-value. We can either use StatCrunch or the t-table to find that p-value. Remember that for the degrees of freedom, we need to take the smaller sample size and subtract 1. So in this case, we would use the sample size of 10 
and we would have nine degrees of freedom. On the t-table, we look at nine degrees of freedom and find the number that's closest to 1.742, our test statistic, the positive version of our test statistic, and that number would be the 1.833 on our table. But the p-value is going to be the area in one tail there, which would be 0 0.05. If we use StatCrunch to find our p-value, we can get more accurate and our p-value comes out to be approximately 0 0.058. In conclusion, we find that the p-value is greater than the significance level of alpha equals 0 0.05, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Because we decided to fail to reject the null hypothesis, that means we do not have evidence to support the company's claim that layout B is going to increase impulse spending. Now let's construct a 90% confidence interval for that hypothesis test. Here is our sample data again for layout A and layout B. And then we have the formula for the confidence interval. We have all of the needed information except for the critical t-score. So we'll go to the t-table and we'll look at 9 degrees of freedom and 90% confidence. 90% confidence is the column that's second from the right, and so we have a critical t-score of 1.833. We plug all the values into the confidence interval formula, and then we'll just plug in the right side of this expression to calculate the margin of error first. The margin of error comes out to be approximately 1.957. And now we will add and subtract that number from the difference in our means. The difference in the sample means is negative 1.86. So we take a negative 1.86 and add and subtract 1.957. So we are 90% confident that the true difference in means between layout A and layout B is between negative 3.817 and 0 0.097. And these would be in dollars, so that means that we're saying that the difference between the two layouts could cause the impulse spending to be lower by $3.817 or up to $0.097 more. Because this confidence interval stretches from a negative number up to a positive number and includes zero, that tells us that we were correct to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Recall that our null hypothesis was that the two means were equal to each other. In other words, the difference between them is equal to zero. And we did find zero in this interval, so it would not give us enough evidence to support the company's claim.